ότι I exotti, I exotti, you're my king. I exotti, I exotti, I exotti, oh Lord. Rock of ages, clap for me, oh, oh, let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, clap for me, clap for me. Oh, let me hide myself in thee. Oh, rock of ages, cleft for me, cleft for me. Oh, let me hide. Myself in thee. You know, in Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, verse uh, 6, the Lord was talking to uh, Miriam and Aaron. And just show you the power of words, how words affect God. In Proverbs chapter 12, no, no, um, uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, the Lord said, Hear now my words. He's talking to Miriam. And Aaron said, hear now my words. He said, if there be a prophet among you, I make myself known unto him in a vision, and I speak unto him in a dream. But in verse 7, Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, he said, with Moses, it is not so. It said that he is faithful in all mine house. The earlier part, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 and on, it said that Moses was the most humblest man in all the earth. That should be the goal of everybody. You should want to be the most humblest person in all the earth. You should want God to be able to say, you're the most humblest. When I come to you, you're the most humblest person. As you're joining in, share this broadcast. I have a powerful word of the Lord right here. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to be on here. I'm telling you, this is going to change your life. Watch this. Then in uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 8, the Lord asked him a question. Were you not afraid to speak against Moses? I speak to him face to face. He is allowed to behold me. He knows how I look. He knows me personally. You wasn't afraid to speak against him? This is what the Lord asked Miriam. And the Bible said that the glory of God departed and Miriam was left with leprosy. See, when the glory of God comes, it could either be a blessing to you or it could become a breakdown for you. The wisest way how to deal with the glory is humbleness and meekness and gentleness. And why do I say gentleness? Because gentleness is you um, approaching every situation with a sound mind, with, with the right gesture and the right attitude and the right adaptation to the method in which God wants you to do a thing. The words that you speak matter to God. You see Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, life and death is in the power of the tongue and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. But then if we go even further, Proverbs chapter 13, I believe, said that a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. We see that the mouth will attract your experiences because your eating is your experiences. But then we go over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. It says, through faith we understand. Through faith we understand that the world's were framed by the word of God. 
That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. He Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. It says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word of God framed the worlds. So every city, every state that you see was framed by the word of God. That's Hebrews 11, 3. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So God put himself in the bracket of word. So word matters to God. It affects God in, in a very deep way. Your words. Your words affect God. Your words affect his presence in your life. Your words affect what you become in his presence. Your words affect whether you go back to sin or you stay forward in righteousness. Your words your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. That's a song that the Holy Spirit, he began to sing this song to me last night. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 said, we understand that through through faith, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 3. John 1, 1 said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was, word was God. But then if we hop over into Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, it says that a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words stirreth up anger. So Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 is saying that soft words turn away wrath. So there is something called soft words, and those soft words means that you're in a place of humbleness. Soft words means that you have became uh, what we see, I believe, in Matthew chapter 5 and on. We're seeing, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You have become a peacemaker. So soft words is confirmation that you have stepped into the office of being a peacemaker. Which means that you are operating in maturity and have graduated in your mentality. Mean that your soul is now successful with God. Well, Proverbs 15.1 says that a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So there's a realm called grievous words. Now, grievous words, who does it grieve first? The Holy Ghost. Before it grieves anybody on earth, it grieves the Holy Ghost because that's not what he's scheduled for you to say. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. But that which is good for the edifying, that it may impart grace. Another text say minister grace unto the hearers. So we see Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, we dealing with God saying that your words can be corrupt. In those words, there is no grace, which means there's no anointing, which means that God did not place his ability to move in those words. So it's only going to move satanic power. It's only going to move satanic power planning and agendas and devices. Proverbs chapter 18 is very important. Proverbs chapter 18, verse uh, 6, it says that a fool's, a fool's lips entereth into contention. 
and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's lips enter into contention. That's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 6. A fool's lips enter into contention. And his mouth calleth for strokes. Which also could be interpreted blows. Which mean being fought, being hit. Domestic retaliation. It said that his mouth calleth for strokes. Which means that what comes out of his mouth is war. What comes out of his mouth causes a situation to be bigger than it should have been. Uh, what comes out of his mouth causes things to become out of hand and chaotic. That's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 6. It says that a fool's lips enter into contention. It enter into contention. It enter into contention. Do you understand? It wasn't in contention. There was no contention. There was no argument. But his lips will bring forth the argument. His lips will bring forth the war. There was no war. But his lips will bring forth the battle. That's Proverbs 18, 6. But Proverbs chap chapter 18, verse 7 says something powerful. It says a fool's mouth is his, in his destruction. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. It said that a fool's mouth we're in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 7. And a fool's mouth is his destruction. And his lips are the snare of his soul. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter um, 18, verse 2. Look what it say there. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2 said this. It said that uh, a fool has no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 is saying that when you are a fool, you don't have delight in God's opinion and his knowledge being established in you. Like, I want you to do things like this. I want you to say things like this. I want you to become this. That is not your delight. Like, you don't have fun. It's not enjoyable to you. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 is revealing that when God reveals to you how he wants you to be as a person, what he wants you to do, the pathway, it is a grievous thing to you. So you understand that in the Gospels, when you saw people walk away from Jesus, they were fools. They wasn't just fools because we trying to shade them. They were fools because the biblical interpretation of a fool is somebody that has no delight. In understanding. Now what is understanding? Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 reveals that understanding is what? Knowledge of the Holy One. And who's the Holy One? Jesus. So the knowledge of Jesus. My goodness. The knowledge of Jesus is understanding. So when the Bible says that a fool has no delight in understanding, it means that a fool does not enjoy the knowledge of Jesus. My goodness. My goodness. And that's why Apostle Paul said, casting down vain imaginations and high things that exalt itself against what? The knowledge of God. Bringing thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2, when it said that a fool has no delight in understanding, it's really interpreted if we dissect Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it really means that a fool does not enjoy, does not have any pleasure in the knowledge of Jesus. So when Jesus exposes his knowledge to you, and how does he expose his knowledge? John 16 say that he's going to expose his knowledge through the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is going to come to you and start teaching you all things. And when you hear the knowledge, it's going to upset you. 
That's how you know you're a fool. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. My goodness. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 said, Reprove a scorner and he will hate thee. You rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9 says that if you give instruction to a wise man, he will be yet wiser. If you teach a just man, he will increase in learning. We're in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. And Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 says that if you reprove, which is translated rebuke, uh, aggressively confront one with truth. It says that if you confront one with truth and they are scorner, it says they will hate thee. But Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9 says that if you rebuke a wise man, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 says that if you rebuke a wise man, he will love thee. You see reactions. But it's all the reaction to words, words of life and righteousness and truth. So the word of God is saying that you will know whether or not you are a wise person or a fool because look at your reaction to rebuke. What is your reaction to a confrontation of truth? How do you respond? So Proverbs chapter 9 says that if you give instruction to a wise man, he will yet be wiser. He is not getting demoted from wisdom to foolishness, from truth to lies and light to darkness. He's going from the next light to the next life, not light. The next glory to the next glory, the next faith to the next faith. It says that he will yet be wiser if you give him an instruction. He's not offended. He's not sorrowful. He's not grievous. Share this broadcast right now. Share it, share it. Then Proverbs chapter 9 Verse 9 says that if you teach a just man, if you teach a just man, it said that he will increase in learning. The just man not telling you, I already know. The just man not telling you, you keep telling me the same thing. The just man, see, it said if you teach a just man, we in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. If you teach a just man, he will increase in learning. So he has postured himself to learn. <laughs> Hallelujah. We glorify your name. Lord, we glorify your name, Lord, we glorify your name in all the earth. We glorify your name. So we look at uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. We see in the reaction of wisdom. If you rebuke the wise man in verse 8, he going to love you. Verse 9, he going to be yet wiser. The just man going to increase in learning. But the fool is a scorner. Verse 8, chapter 9, is saying that you're going to hate the person that's rebuking you. That's Confronting you with truth. You're going to hate them. Lord, we glorify. We glorify your name. All the earth is filled with his glory. All the earth is filled with his glory. All the earth is filled 
with his glory. Glory to the Lord. All the earth is filled with his power. All the earth is filled. Now, the scorner we find in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, is a seat, meaning a position in the second heaven. Remember, Ephesians is saying that he made you to sit in the heavenly places with Christ. So the heavenly places we understand is uh, above the earth, right? But look, it got a seat above the earth, right? Well, the scorner is a seat above the earth as well, but is in the second heaven. So like you position yourself with principalities. The seat of the scorner is what we're seeing in Proverbs 9.8. It says, if you reprove the scorn, if you rebuke the scorn, he will hate thee. Which means to have an extreme disliking towards you. Which means to slander you. When it says that he will hate thee, it means that he will have bad words to tell others about you. It means that his opinion of you will become very, very dark. You'll become his issue. Because the scorner is sitting down in a seat with demons. And demons are able to transfer fouls of lies. Hate. So you understand how do you overcome this? My goodness, you get wisdom because the Bible said the wise man, if you rebuke him, he'll hate you. I mean, he'll love you. The scorner, if you rebuke him, he'll hate you. So wisdom is the adversary of scorning and foolishness and folly. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Then James chapter 1 verse 6 say, but let him ask in wisdom, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a, 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 a wave of the sea. Driven by the wind and tossed. There we see in James chapter 1 verse 7. It says, let not that man think that he'll receive anything of the Lord. And then Proverbs, uh, no, James chapter 1 verse 8 says, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I want to read this again. James chapter 1. We in James chapter 1 verse 5. It says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Upbraideth not means that he's not prejudiced. He's not rejecting your application. He's not denying you access to wisdom. He's not selecting who he's going to give wisdom. It's an open gift to all that acts. Wow. James chapter 1 verse 5 said that he abradeth not and it shall be given him. But then James chapter 1 verse 6 says, but let him act in wisdom. That's the condition. And uh, let him act in faith, nothing wavering. Let him act in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind, a wave of the sea. Think about water driven by the wind and tossed. When you waver after you ask God for wisdom, and like your mind starts saying, well, oh, man, he's not talking to me. I don't know what to do. I still don't know what to do. It says that it's tossed. When you waver, you become. Now, why did it use a wave of the sea? 
driven by the wind and toss. Why did he use these terminologies? Because this represents that you're now in the natural realm. And the natural realm where the God of this world, which is Satan, rules, is now guiding you. Guiding your mood, guiding your mentality, guiding your movement. Your mood, M-O-O-D. Your move, M-O-V-E. Your mind, M-I-N-D. Do you know what's happening to you right now? I'm anointing you. I'm giving you an apostolic and prophetic anointing right this very day. That's what I'm doing. I'm anointing you as you're watching this. I'm anointing you. I'm giving you a new anointing. Somebody write me out here. I'm giving you a new anointing. I'm giving you a new anointing. James chapter 1 verse 6. For he that wavereth. Let him ask him for faith. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Driven by the wind and tossed. Verse 7 says. Let not that man think that he'll receive anything of the Lord. See, you can cancel out your receptivity. You say, Lord, I ask you for wisdom. I receive wisdom. But if you start wavering, you cancel it out. You reject what you received. You deny what you developed. You can deny what you developed. You can deny what you developed. And then look what it says right here. It says a double-minded man. We in James chapter 1 verse 8. He is unstable in all his ways. So you birth instability by doubt. Doubt. Burst instability. Suspicion of God. Grants position with demons. Suspicion of God grants position with demons. Suspicion of God. Grants position with demons. Suspicion of God grants position with demons. Wow. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17. It says, the highway of the upright. No, before I even go there. Let's go, let's go over here to um, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. It says, lean not to your own understanding. Yes, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But it says, lean not to your own understanding. This is why I want to magnify Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 5. Lean not to your own understanding. But then Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 says, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 is real remarkable. This is something that people miss. Because they're wise in their own eyes. It says, be not wise in thine own eyes. Don't say, oh, um, I can win this person to the Lord even though God disconnected me from them. I, I can save this person even though God told me not to talk to them. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't say, no, I can go to this place. I'm still not going to get drunk. I'm still not going to get high. I still ain't going to do nothing wrong. Don't be wise in thine own eyes. Follow the wisdom of God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord. That means respect him, reverence him. And we see in Proverbs 9, uh, 10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when it says fear the Lord, it's saying to tap into his wisdom, not your wisdom, nor the wisdom that comes from Satan. I think that's James chapter 3, that the wisdom that comes from this earth realm is sensual. It's devilish. That demonic wisdom. It says, fear the Lord. And then what happened? It says, uh, fear the Lord. It said, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. And what does it say next? Depart from evil. 
that means the thing that God is revealing to you that he doesn't like. Depart from evil simply means what I am communicating to you that I don't want to see you doing, saying, or thinking. Get away from it quickly and immediately. That's what departure means. Departure is to get as far as possible away from the thing that is God's pet peeve. He doesn't like it. Now, what does Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17 say? It says the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. And then it says that he that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17 says the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. Then it says that he that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. How do you preserve your soul? There is a way. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8 and on. I think it's past verse 8, but uh, probably verse 8 and on. It says that there shall be a highway. And a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. And then the later part of the text said that no man shall err therein. You see what it's saying in Isaiah 35. He talking about there shall be a way of holiness. There's no more error in the way of holiness because you've been made whole by the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that's guiding you, ruling you inspiring you, you in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and on, you led by the Spirit, you a son of God. You're being filled with the Spirit, like Colossians say. And look, it's telling you that this is a highway. It's a highway. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17 says that the highway of the right causes him to depart from evil. It's the, it's the highway of the right to depart from evil. And he that keepeth his way, preserveth his soul. You want to protect your soul from grief? You want to protect your soul from struggles, depression, demons, defeat, distraction? Keep your way. The Holy Spirit always gives you a way. He gives you a way, a way that he wants your day to go, a way that he wants you to conduct yourself, a way of who to focus on, who to pleasure, a way of who to talk to, a way of who to ignore, a way of who to block, a way of who to engage, a way of who to sow into, a way of who to learn from, a way of who to, to keep yourself in connectivity with, a way. Think about this. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. You want your mind, your will, and emotions to be untouched by the devil? Stick to the way. The way that the Holy Spirit is inspiring and revealing to you. He wants you to become. He wants you to talk. He wants you to think. He wants you to learn. 